Welcome back to the Wingspan Podcast, episode 14. I'm Doug Barrack, joined by my co-host Chris Mahalan of Nets Daily and our special guest. Our guest is an on-air talent, producer, and writer who has worked with such companies as MSG Networks, Slam Magazine, SB, and SB Nation. He has created award-nominated shows like Side Hustle and the Ain't Hard to Tell Podcast. We welcome Brian Fonseca to the pod. Thank you for taking some time out of your night to join Doug and I. How are you doing? Do you know how many people just rolled their eyes at that intro? They're like, oh, they're bringing this fucking guy in. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I, I would say you were the guy who wrote it, but nah. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you. I'm not uh I'm not I'm not well liked in these streets these days. <laughs> well, good thing we're on the internet then. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Okay. Well, okay, Brian, I guess we'll kick it off first. Let's just talk about your journey to where you are today, what college you went to, what was your first sports media position or internship. Right. Yeah, that was all joking, by the way. Or at, least, <laughs> at least I think so. Um, let's see, college. I went to St. Francis College in Brooklyn, and they uh, don't have, like, an extensive sort of journalism program, but I went there for journalism anyway. Um, so I studied, what, film and broadcasting, digital media as a whole, which it later became, it was film and broadcast journalism, and then it just became digital media because they combined a whole bunch of majors and all that stuff. Um, and at that point, I and I was just thinking about this yesterday. It's pretty funny. After my first two years, I almost dropped out because my grades were bad. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't doing so well in the classroom. I failed a class or two, uh, maybe two. <laughs> I'm not gonna say, uh, confirm or deny that, but yeah. <laughs> and I might and I might have withdrew another one. <laughs> so, but so yeah, things are looking shaky. I was thinking about, yo, could I transfer? Could I try to do this, you know, thing and drop out? And at that point, I didn't really have much work experience, uh, other than this blog I was running, which you know that doesn't really count. And then um, in 2014, I had a mass communications class, and then I ran into my professor who was teaching in that class one day and he just was like, yo, come to my office because like he actually liked my writing from the writing assignments. Like he would give me like 99, 95, 97, you know, stuff like that. So he's like, yo, you cover sports or you want to cover sports. You should write at the student newspaper. And I didn't really know we had a newspaper at that time because we were such a small school. So to make a long story less long, uh, I started junior year, like literally the second day of school, cover my first volleyball game. Went to a lot of volleyball games, did a bunch of basketball as, as the year progressed and cross country and track and soccer and just all that stuff. And then, you know, picked up one freelance gig, picked up another gig, became sports editor, got a job at CBS at one point. Then just everything just sort of started falling into place after I had that one conversation uh, with Mark McSherry, who is still out here in the journalism world. So, yeah. And then did you always know that you were going to uh, pursue a career in like journalism or anything like that? Or is it like when you talked about when the guy pulled you in his office, he's like, hey, you could write. Is that when it really kicked in for you? Um, Maybe I, I feel like I did, but I feel like he sort of helped me believe it. And I think that because I, I had run, I had wanted to pursue that for years. Like my dad always used to bring home the daily news and I used to just read that before the daily news sort of turned to what it is now. And at that point, I was like really invested in just the sports section and just sort of reading it and things of that nature. And that was when, you know, Mike Lupica was there, Frank Isola, et cetera, et cetera. And I had just always sort of like used to write down little short stories in these books that I had, little box scores I used to make up and I used to calculate stats like a fucking nerd and then do all this shit. And then um, what's it called? As I sort of gotten older, um, yeah, I knew that that's sort of what I wanted to do. And then I would obviously, you know, watch Sports Center. Like I used to watch, there was two things I always used to watch before I go to school and it would be Sports Center and just MTV because I used to like music videos and that's how I got into hip hop. So basically those two things sort of intersected. And then I was like, all right, I want to write and I want to do the TV stuff because that was when I saw people sort of doing that at that time. The plan was to write at the Daily News and then do TV at like SNY and then eventually ESPN. As you grow up and learn just sort of how the business works, 
And if you're me, you care less about the necessary brands. You care more about just, you know, doing the work, doing a good job with whomever it may be. It doesn't matter the sort of company or whatever the case may be and all that stuff. But yeah, like that sort of started at a young age, but I feel like I started to really believe it in college. And then I was moving, you know, things were moving fast. I was moving up fast, picking up a lot of gigs, you know, and that then it sort of, you know, manifested itself into more and more belief, if you will. Yeah, that's great. I feel that. And then what were some of your major takeaways in college that you learned kind of as an undergrad and everything? Um, I, Like I learned that at St. Francis, and this is not really a knock on them, but it's just different going there as opposed to going to the journalism programs they have in Northwestern and Fordham and Syracuse and Columbia and all these other places that have like big, big journalism programs. So people go there and they graduate with an advantage Obviously, you have a lot more connections. You're in an esteemed journalism program that has a history of 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 churning out people. But I guess if you know me, it kind of makes sense that I would take the freaking oddball route <laughs> and go to St. Francis because I don't I don't know what sort of path there was, you know, for a journalist at that time, you know, coming out of St. Francis. There wasn't like this pipeline that we had. Now we've sort of developed one because you have like Frank Stanfield who does like fantasy stuff and does stuff on MSG. You have me doing stuff with MSG and you have other people who've really come through that pipeline. And really, I told this dude this the other day that Dexter, Dexter Henry, you guys know, um, he started working there when I was there as a freshman. I didn't meet him till my senior year, but around that time he had a bunch of student workers that he was helping develop and things like that. He's really established that pipeline where since he's been there and he's left now on some, you know, bigger stuff, but since he's been there, he sort of developed a lot of the student workers, myself included, to establish this pipeline of, you know, this person's gotten a job here, this person's been able to do this independently, this person's done this. And it's just a lot of people that wear different hats in media, whether it's in front of the camera, behind the camera, writing, et cetera, et cetera. So around the time I got there is when that sort of, that pipeline, I guess, was being established. So I'm a part of that. And Dexter's really helped establish that, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely. That makes sense. That makes yeah, sense. So I'm really glad you brought up Dexter Henry because I know he, at least from my perspective, is one of your probably your biggest mentors. But before we deep dive into more of your relationship with him, since mm-hmm. you, I feel like you hang out with him like every few weeks, but that's only because you guys have a pod together, something like that. But more who are some of your, <laughs> but anyways, so who are some of your other mentors? Like not just from your time at St. Francis, but up to now, let's say, like in between oh. the time and even maybe before them. Jesus Christ. Um, you, don't, miss- you don't have to do all 100 of them, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of people in your life. Like, there there are, a bu- there are a bunch of people that I lean on for not really just advice because that's sort of self-absorbent and selfish. And I don't really look to them for advice as much as I look to them for just, like, you know, uh, just certain things, whether it could be guidance, which I guess is another form of advice, but it doesn't sound as corny. Um but there, yeah, there are definitely other people like in this field that I sort of interact with in that way. If I let me see, Jennifer Williams from Fox Five is one. Her and I are pretty cool. Jeff Eisenben, uh, who's really just a year older than me, but we go back and forth on a lot of things and ideas and stuff like that. Gerard Hector, uh, who you guys probably know, he's somebody that I'm pretty close with. So yeah, there's definitely Rob Lopez. He's probably another one. Um, there are a bunch of others that I'm probably gonna miss, but yeah, there's definitely uh. A list of people and i feel like you need to have that and i think that also comes from having an older brother my, my brother is in his early 40s without giving away his age directly um and he is somebody who i obviously grew up around and our age gap meant that all of his friends were around his age so a lot of them when he would watch me would hang out and i would roll with them all the time so i sort of had these people in my life at a very young age already So growing up, I always had friends who were also much older than me. I also had friends that were my age, but I also had friends that were much older than me. So it makes a sort of mentor, protege, older brother, younger brother sort of relationship that I have there translate to what I have now in the field, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely. That makes sense. Jumping back to Dexter Henry one more time, third time's charm. So can you talk about a little bit more about your relationship with Dexter? Like, did you ever see yourself back then? to where you are now kind of like producing various content that's, you know, as you mentioned, as we mentioned before, and as you like to say, award-winning. 
for rightful reasons. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, that's important to know because people think that if you're independent and you don't have a big brand behind you like that, you ain't shit. But they're wrong Truth. about that. So you know, I gotta, I gotta sort of straighten some things out. But yeah, no, nah, um, Dexter and I, we met. We didn't even meet till 2015, so I was a senior. Um, we met in 2015, and we we've been in the same building the whole time or whatever. Uh, we may have met in my junior year or whatever, just sort of in passing, but we really like had our first set of conversations very early in my senior year. He had this sort of idea. Now, there's two versions of the story. There's his version and there's my version. My version is the correct one. But my version of the story is that basically he had this idea to have um, – a sort of rotating panel of SFC Today sports people, SFC Today being the student newspaper at St. Francis College, sports people uh, pop in and give halftime analysis uh, on the broadcast during games and stuff like that. I was really the only sports person in my senior year because the people that I was with, Rob DeVita and my boy Akeem Nelson, my junior year, they both graduated because they were a year above me. So when I became the sports editor, it was kind of just me covering just about everything. So I was kind of the only person that was in that quote unquote rotation. So he had that idea. And somewhere along the line, we had hip hop conversations. He discovered the kind of hip hop I was into, which is really the hip hop of his era. So naturally, we bonded over that. We agreed on a lot of the same things philosophically and how to go about uh, business and stuff like that. And because I also started working at the athletic department, so I was also doing PR as sort of like a double agent at the time. Uh, we always were in the same office, the same area. So naturally, we just started talking, hanging out, doing a lot of work together, things like that. I uh, started doing some backpack broadcasting stuff in March of 2016. So this was a few months after we first met. And we just kept working together on a bunch of different projects and talking all the time. And, you know, that sort of manifests itself. I keep using that damn word uh, into what into what you guys see today with the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast and with the backpack broadcasting stuff and with some sideline story stuff that we've done since and that we uh, plan on continuing in the near future. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, exactly. I feel that. And that's 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 good to hear. And then can you talk a little about how you got the Nets Daily since me and you got that connection? Doug's got a little bit of connection to Nets Daily as well. And obviously Dexter. And Dexter yeah. as well. I mean, well, that came from Dexter because at that time he was still doing some video stuff. And, you know, he just had me sort of inquire in, in May or whatever of 2016. Uh, so I did that was able to write a pre-draft story that didn't really have much of a pick, but it was sort of like, you know, who could they get at number 55? And, you know, could they find somebody like Isaiah Thomas, who was picked that late in the second round? And then, you know, I was able to get the opportunity to go to games, go to practices, just sort of from there, um, because I wanted to actually do the reporting. You know what I mean? Like, I got... And, and that was the thing, too. Like, the whole Nest Daily thing is interesting because, like, I'm pretty much the only person who at the site isn't really or wasn't really when I was there a net fan. So mm -hmm. it was a it was a different experience having all these sort of net fans just follow you and whatever. And a lot of the Nets fans that I've interacted with are pretty cool, the ones that uh, still follow me. Um but thank you. You know, a lot of them yeah, I mean but a lot of them, you know, once once they saw um that I wasn't a Nets fan, they were put off by that. And I couldn't, I didn't quite understand it, but then you sort of realize, like, oh, Nets Daily is a Nets fan blog, so that sort of makes my existence with the site weird. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because uh, I'm exactly. like, yeah, because I'm like, I'm not really a Nets fan, I'm covering this from a reporter perspective. But I understand that the websites that are part of SB Nation, uh, the, the fan sites, they're literally called fan sites, so they're for, you know, a destination for fans to go there, and this, is and that. It's just philosophically, um, you know, I'm trying to approach this from an objective sort of reporter mindset. And I was able to make it work for three years. You know, don't get me wrong. So it was a tremendous experience. But it's just a sort of I think it's a different way that people didn't uh, fully understand, you know, from from that time, if that makes sense. No, that makes sense, especially for me, because I'm I'm still a part of Nets Daily, and I exactly know where you're coming from. Because a lot of the audience at Nets Daily, if not all the audience, is strict Nets, Nets fans. Yeah, and I, I know your background and everything, so I could see exactly where kind of that perspective is. But what yeah, were some but, of your? But a lot of people don't. <laughs> oh, <laughs> a lot yeah, of that, that, don't. that's for sure. And I and oh, I yeah. get and I get that. I, to, to this to this day, there are people that just unfollow me on Twitter uh, because they see that I'm not posting that much net stuff. 
anymore as I used to be. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. I don't know why. I don't know why you would follow somebody just just based off one sort of thing to begin with. But that's just me. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I just want a diverse timeline of people talking about different things. But I don't know. That's sort of how people uh people are different to approach things, I guess. Yeah, I feel that. And what were some of your major takeaways from Nets Daily? Um, the access was good. I mean, I'll say that because not every SB Nation site is going to get that with the team they cover. I remember meeting somebody who, uh, not meeting them because they weren't here, uh, but online, uh, talking to somebody who they write at the Spurs or written at the Spurs or knew somebody who wrote at the Spurs SB Nation site. And they were saying that they didn't really get access to stuff. And then I know, um, that's some other SB Nation sites, T, uh, fan sites they don't really get access to the team that's in their area and the Nets and the Nets do with Nets daily because of the years that they've had uh, so to speak and all the experiences and things like that so that was cool and I felt like I was able to take advantage of that when I was there and obviously you know work with Pooch and work with Tom and the guys and things like that that was cool too. One last question about your time in Nets daily from being in the building and being facility and all that kind of stuff who are some of the people that you're still in touch with that you were back then? Oh, um, I've spoken to Spencer Dinwiddie. You know, I've spoken to Spencer Dinwiddie since. I, I I wouldn't say that we're like texting every day, but yeah, there there are some player connections. Jared Dudley and I have have spoken. Um, like there are some player connections. Um, Pooch is texting me. Tom Lorenzo's hit me up. Yeah, like they're they're definitely. I mean, Chris, obviously, he's here. <laughs> I guess so. I'm here. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. There's definitely that, and then just some people in the league. Uh, some people that I've been able to make connections with from being there at that time. Um, I I think that yeah, I think that's that's the part of it, right? It's just being able to exploit that opportunity for as long as you could and making the most of the situation as you could. Um. You know, obviously, the and I've talked about this on my podcast, the the part of leaving was mainly based off of just the business. It didn't work out for me necessarily. You know, for some people, you know, they want to be around the team and cover it regardless of whatever the price is. But for me, it's like I just at that number that you get the, the stipend for, it just didn't work out for me. So I was like, yeah, I can't really do this for a fourth season because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um just from that standpoint, especially given the things that I'm trying to do, uh, otherwise it just would it just wouldn't make sense to to go for it again. Um, and you know that's kind of why that's kind of why that happened. So, uh, which sports were the most impactful on your life? Like we talked a little bit about basketball. You lightly mentioned volleyball. I don't know if that would be the biggest, but no, absolutely not. Um, no disrespect though, because some of the volleyball athletes are cool as hell uh, that I covered in high school. In high school, you hear me. In college, no. But the biggest sports. I mean, I'm Puerto Rican, so it's it's baseball, it's boxing, and it's basketball. You know what I'm saying? Like growing up, I was a Met fan, like out the womb. You know, thanks to my dad. And with boxing, I remember having, you know, time with the family, watching Felix Trinidad fights from very early on in my life. I want to say even three years old. I remember watching him, you know, like that early on in my life. And he had lost to Bernard Hopkins when I was seven, but I remember watching a bunch of his fights in between that time. I remember being excited for his comeback in 2004. So the sort of athletes that really stood out in my childhood that sort of stuck with me were like Stone Cold Steve Austin. We could start there because I used to get mad when he used to lose on Raw. Um, and I used to really, really, really complain if we didn't get to watch wrestling because my brother put me on very, very, very early. I'm talking like Attitude Era, 1998, 1999, like that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Mike Piazza, uh, Trish Stratus, first celebrity crush, um, and Felix Trinidad. Those were the sort of athletes. And then, you know, I obviously got into football. I had a Curtis Martin jersey because I was a Jet fan back in the day before I gave that up. Um, sorry, Doug. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, Curtis Martin had a John. That's another thing, too. I used to wear a lot of jerseys. I used to get a lot of jerseys. And... You know, I had a you lot also of used to wear your hair yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, I did that too. I had braids. Um, Alan Houston was one of the first jerseys I got. Jason Kidd too. The Nets Jason Kidd one, not the not the Phoenix one. I had Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, and Paul Pierce before they all got together. I actually, and the, the funny thing is, going back to sort of uh, the Nets Daily thing, I should have mentioned this before. I first knew about them back when they were like just a regular blog in like the mid two thousands because my brother used to go on the site. My brother, my brother is actually a Net fan. 
my older brother that I mentioned before, is actually a Net fan and was a season ticket holder for about 10, 11 seasons between like 03 and 13, pretty much. So your boy used to go to a lot of Net games. So I was there for the 12 win season. I was there for Devin Harris. I was there for Darren Williams. I was there for all that stuff. Um, I just wasn't really a fan of the team, but I wanted to see them and the Knicks do well. He used to bring me to a lot of Nets games and some Knicks games too, but he hates the Knicks, so not as many Knicks games. And uh, yeah, so that's that. All of, all of that is like a part of my childhood and helped sort of shape me, if you will. I feel that. And then we got to transition a little bit. We got to talk some WWE. How are you feeling about AEW right now? I'm I'm not as into it as I thought I would be. You know what I mean? I. I I I don't watch as much wrestling now as I used to. And I know Dexter, if he hears this, he's going to think I'm lying, but it's true. <laughs> I mainly just watch NXT, NXT UK, and then I'll watch pay-per-views and things like that. NXT, because that is the best. That's just the best shit out, period. Oh, I, I agree with that. NXT agree is that. amazing. Um, NXT UK has Tony Storm, and I love me some Tony Storm. And, uh, like... Raw and SmackDown is just – I could tune in in spurts. Like, I can catch Becky Lynch, Shayna Baszler, Seth Rollins, Sasha Banks, and New Day and all that stuff. But I'm not I, – I can't sit there for, like, three hours or two hours and just do it unless, like, I'm playing, like, 2K or something. And then I just have it on off to the side so I can glance every couple minutes or so and listen the whole time like a podcast. But, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. I feel that. Because the thing with WWE is, me and my cousin were talking about this the other day. I feel like WWE doesn't really know how to work with, like, more, like, characters. You know what I mean? Like, you got, yeah. like, a Tyler Breeze or, like, someone with that personality and that type of, like, characteristic. They don't know how to work that into, like, a championship pedigree or something like that. And then AEW, like, their promos are good, obviously. They're they're open. They're not scripted and stuff like that. But I I, I gotta give it to you. NXT's like yeah, NXT's like perfect. That's the NXT. Thing. Just, yeah, NXT just hits it out of the park with that stuff. I was watching uh who did Adam Cole and who did he just wrestle at the last pay, at the last big show? Was it Gargano or was no? It Johnny Gargano. I want to say it was Johnny Gargano. No, it was Champa because Gargano came. Spoiler alert. Uh, mm-hmm. Gargano came out and screwed over Ciampa and that. And I'm like, the theater is just great. Adam Cole is probably the best wrestler on the planet. And NXT, I just feel like they do just about everything right. It's ridiculous. And I'm kind of waiting for the other shoe to fall. I'm like, they got to mess us up at some point. But they still don't. And it's been a few years I've been saying that. And it's awesome. I don't Not care exactly. what people say about wrestling because I'm still going to watch that shit sometimes. Yeah, I know. It's fake. We get it. <laughs> Dude, it's entertaining. Okay. That's the main, that's the main take Doug, from the whole thing. It's a, it's a live action movie. That's all it is. <laughs> exactly. If people, if people could sit at home and watch Friends, then I could sit at home and watch NXT. <laughs> <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. Oh, man. <laughs> Let's transition to the big one, the Wilder Fury. What were your thoughts on that? I think uh, Deontay Wilder, <sighs> like I p- see, I picked them to win, but I, I kind of, my head, my head was like, yeah, you should go with Tyson Fury instead. And the reason why is because he did, I did think he won the first fight. He didn't get the nod, but I did think he should have won. And I just think that his ability to get inside and outside his ability to throw combinations at the rate in which he does at his size six nine two seventy something whatever it was um his movement his jab he's the only heavyweight who is really longer than deontay wilder and is able to use his length he can stay out of distance because of that he can hit him from distances and angles that deontay wilder can't anticipate because of that and i'm just watching all this and i'm like yeah deontay wilder's only got the best finishing ability that we've ever seen, but only that finishing ability. So if he doesn't, you know, rock him, then he's kind of asked out because in other fights against even uh, fighters who aren't superior to Tyson Fury, who are actually far less superior to Tyson Fury, like Gerald Washington um, and Dominic Brazil, not Dominic Brazil, because that only was one round and he almost killed him. But like Gerald Washington, for example, that Deontay Wilder was getting outboxed even by those guys, but he still came back and knocked him out because he's trying to look for that opening. I think Tyson Fury is the only guy that could do that to Deontay Wilder, though, because I still think Deontay Wilder would knock out just about any heavy, no, every single other heavyweight on the planet, and that includes Anthony Joshua. But you don't want to get me started on that tangent. Trust me. <laughs> you want to get you want to get started? I don't. <laughs> I just think <laughs> I just think that look. I just. 
the zone yesterday they posted all right fine i'm gonna i'll give you a couple minutes of this the zone posted a photo yesterday of anthony joshua and tyson fury staring at each other in a ring it was a photo that they they made up but the zone is acting like that they're not trying to kill the sport of boxing with every freaking youtube fight that they put out anthony joshua <laughs> Anthony Joshua is not going to fight Tyson Fury if Eddie Hearn has anything to say about it unless they get a certain amount of money. And then I'll believe it when the contracts are signed because they've had this. Uh, Tyson Fury said this. He said this to Joe Rogan and he said this in other interviews. They had the opportunity to make the Tyson Fury fight multiple times. They rejected it. He went over to fight Deontay Wilder and that's why Tyson Fury has a ton of respect for Deontay Wilder because they were able to bring ESPN and Fox together to make the fight. But the zone is over there putting up one side of fights that nobody cares about and killing the sport of boxing on the other side of things. So, That's what it is. Yeah. Exactly. I was literally just going to bring that up. The zone with all – listen, the, the YouTube boxing with KSI, Logan Paul, the other Paul brother and all that. I don't blame yeah, them like, for doing that. I don't, I don't blame that. Yeah, exactly. But, but they it's they like, get the views. They yeah, get the views, but yeah, still. Yeah. yeah, but it's also like with, with the zone, the problem is like they're not – I don't think they're that invested in the sport because they – you know what? <laughs> I was gonna say I was gonna say something else that I would probably uh, regret, but I'm just I'm just gonna let it rock for now. <laughs> just tell us off the record, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. It's a, it's an off the record thing, but just yeah, I'm just not I'm just not I'm just not here for that. I'm like, yo, if you're actually gonna make the fight happen, then go ahead and make the fight happen because it's not like you didn't have these opportunities before. Point blank. No, but you know what? You know what? One fight I want to see happen: Garcia against Javante Davis. Because I feel like that's gonna that's really gonna let us know like what Ryan Garcia is about and everything. I mean, I wanted to see Javante Davis versus Tevin Farmer, but Tevin Farmer lost his last fight to JoJo Diaz. Exactly. That that yeah. sort of disappointed me. I still want to see Deontay Wilder fight Anthony Joshua because I've been saying for years, literally for years, that Deontay Wilder would knock him out, and I want to see if I'm right or not. <laughs> like, if I'm being totally honest. I feel okay. that. Thank you for sharing your knowledge on other sports other than basketball. Who would have thought you could cover more than one thing and be interested in more than one thing? You know, the one-dimensional. Yo, I, but, the, but, that, but that's been a battle. That's been a battle. I'm saying, like, yo, people – th- that was another thing with, the, with, with, with going to Nets Daily, writing at the newspaper and doing all these other things. And some people will just like, oh, this person follows – and covers way too much, so I can't keep up with this. So I'm just gonna like not really, you know, mess with the things he's doing. And I think it's this weird thing where people just want you to be something that they want you to be. Period. You know what I mean? They just want to sort of put you in this box and be like, I want to go f- to you for just Nets information. I want to go to you for just boxing information. I want to go to you for just MMA information. When it's like they don't allow you to try to be all those things and they won't be accepting of that. That's another thing that I've sort of had to battle. And I'm still, quite frankly, battling that uh, because my timeline could be all over the place at times. And if people don't want to sort of get with that, then they don't have to. But what I'm saying is like, that's another thing that people battle that I didn't necessarily learn in J school. And that's something that people... um, you know, try to control also from the outside. Whereas if you just do mainly one thing, like if I'm just an MMA blogger and I start covering all the MMA stuff, then yeah, I'm just going to get a, I'm going to get a lot of followers. I'm going to get more followers, like a lot of them that are just MMA fans, but then God forbid you veer off into ethics or politics or religion or, um, you know, anything else, then people are going to be like, oh, what's this? Stick to MMA. I'm out of here. Like, that's a real thing that people have to battle that other people don't realize or don't care to realize. It ain't hard to tell where we're going almost next. But um, so where do you – sorry, I need to get out of my system. So where do you see the field of sports journalism ahead? And you kind of mentioned it a little bit beforehand, but let's go into it. I, I have no idea. Um, I, I literally have no idea because I, I, sometimes I'm scared. Because everything is so numbers driven and aggregator heavy and then there are other outlets who are eliminating talent overall and just supplanting them with former athletes or just using athletes and entertainers as opposed to using journalists to get stories across. And, you know, obviously we're trained to do that. They're not. So we're going to do it in a better way in most cases. But sometimes there's a, a place for that. Like in the Players Tribune, obviously, what are they trying to, to, to do? They're trying to eliminate the sort of middleman. Um, so... It's all about just finding creative ways to stand out uh, and not necessarily go against that, but just carving your own lane. I don't really I don't really know what the answer is. I definitely don't know what the answer is monetarily. Otherwise, I would (laughs) I would have, excuse me, much different answer to that. But I just think that it's going to get 
uh probably more creative and innovative in some ways but then more invasive in others and you know recently i was like some of the things that i've experienced i'm like yo i understand totally why people quit this like i understand why after a few years or after a certain amount of years people look at this throw their hands up and they're like oh like fuck this because it's hard to get a job like point blank period we could start at the most basic thing when you're grow when you're young and you're growing up what they tell you is that, OK, you go you go to high school, you go to college, you pick a major. And then when you're done or while you're there, you get an internship. And then when you're done, you get a job. Point blank, period. Yeah. But it's like right right when they don't tell you that, oh, the world is changing. So you're going to have to freelance here, get this stipend, freelance there, get this stipend, freelance there, get this stipend, live with your parents a little bit longer than you plan to. Um you know, save your money because it, you know, the city you live in is very expensive. Uh, oh, you got this opportunity here, then you got this, you're freelancing all over the place. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, you got to pick up a part-time job to do something that you don't really want to do, but you have to do it to make ends meet. And then, okay, that's not for you. So you want to leave that. And then at some point you're going to have to do all this. And then it's like, oh, wait, now all of a sudden, since I don't have that other part-time job, I have to take all these freelance jobs. So now all of a sudden I'm a full-time freelancer, which means I don't get tax returns because everything is W-9, and that means you actually have to pay in the spring, which I'm about to do in a few weeks. Um, hopefully the IRS doesn't listen to your podcast. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's basically that's basically what it is. It's like these are the things that you sort of learn on the fly and they don't tell you. Um, I don't even know if I answered your question, but – It's I, tough because like we've had other guests talk about like, well – Maybe less paper, more digital, more podcasting, more types of podcasting, whether it's vlogs or you, you know just the audio. Answers? Like, <laughs> yeah, like I mean, it's such a general question. You can run with it in so many different ways, and yeah. it's all opinion based. Yeah. Like, there's no right answer. I mean, some of us. I mean, like, those things. Those things are pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, we're definitely going more digital. We're absolutely going more digital than we were before. Now, I still like the. I actually still like print. You know, I like the idea of having something in my hands and reading it, but I'm not out here buying newspapers like I used to be because I'm just reading them things on my phone. You know what I mean? But in, in terms of all that, and now everybody has a podcast, so it's like how you sort of, how do you sort of thrive in that market if everybody's it's clearly doing TikTok. It? You know what? Oh, I hate TikTok. I hate I hate that people are <laughs> I forcing knew you were gonna I say that. I, I can't take that. I hate that people are forcing TikTok upon us and not just letting it happen. Like Twitter yeah, was yeah. Invented, Twitter was invented in two thousand four. It didn't really pop semi pop until two thousand ten and then it popped a few years later. Like it takes time and TikTok is just basically vine for, you know, they're Fine pushing kids. it. They're pushing it. Yeah, it's just stop it. Um. Anyway, uh, no disrespect to anyone using TikTok though, because like some people are actually funny. Some people are actually really good with that stuff. But I'm like, yo, just don't force it. Just let it happen organically. But yeah, I don't know. Like that. That's that's sort of how things are going from a general standpoint. But just from the business side is my concern because it's like, all right, how is this? How how are you able to get monetization for a lot of these things? Like, yes, you could do these projects, but then at the same point, you're gonna have to have several side hustles for even your side hustle to sort of get that uh going and then how do you sort of manufacture that from there and then it's just it's just it's a lot of gray area that people don't sort of account for and don't really care to on the outside looking in exactly i can't agree with that more exactly there's no clear-cut answer to that question that's how it is and this podcast episode is brought to you by anchor anchor is an app that allows podcast producers to record and create original content it is free to record and create a podcast, giving producers the ability to easily edit their material off their phone or computer. Anchor allows producers and talent to make money off their work with no minimum listenership. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you on platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many more. To get started, Anchor app or go to anchor.fm. Anchor for Doug and I has been great and allows us to bring unique, creative, and opinionated content to the listeners of the Wingspan podcast. And let's just transition a tiny bit more. Let's just talk about what you do. So as you mentioned before, uh, you created award-nominated shows such as Side Hustle and Ain't Hard to Tell Podcast. So you can talk about a little kind of the insight behind your creative process and who have been some of your most memorable guests with no pressure on you. Yeah, they don't have to be just Nets-oriented, okay? Um, well, I mean, I ain't Eagle, though. I know, <laughs> so I, I know, Eagle, I know. Yeah. That's, that that's, episode was good. That's still our number one, uh, you know, most de- – I'm not a numbers guy. 
you guys know me. Like, I care about the quality of content for I could give a fuck less about how many followers somebody has or how many, you know, views something got because that doesn't overall dictate how good something is or even how impactful something is. And but that episode was both impactful and it was it was heavy on just you know views and interaction and things like that and obviously that's that's where you try to go you know uh me and iron are pretty cool so i just shot him a text he said he would do it we worked out yeah uh he came through and that was probably our biggest one no it definitely was our biggest one but we've had uh we've had like our guest list like not to not to sort of be that guy but no, like, be that guy it's okay that, be that guy no, but like it's real though because like we we just do this independently, just like pretty much you know most people just start a podcast. We That's started exactly in, why I want you to be that guy. We started we started in August of 2017 was when we put out our first teaser. I was 23 at the time. Dexter was 30, whatever. He's young. He's in his early 30s. And um, at the time, we're just like, yo, we should we should do this. We actually thought about doing it earlier than even that, but we took a while to even think of like name and all that stuff and then once we came back for uh because we were working at st francis at the time we used to do our podcast in the back of a boardroom in that building we used to just rent it out um for free <clears throat> um and then uh what's it called we just did that we had um robin lumberg was our first guest and that was our second episode i just shot him a message because you know we're pretty cool spencer dinwiddie came through and this is before he became spencer dinwiddie so it was much 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 easier <laughs> to sort of get him to do it and this was uh, our third episode. And then, yeah, like, we've had a pretty, like, I'm proud of the guest list that we've assembled, and I'm proud of the episodes we've done just by being independent with really no budget other than, like, just doing things out of pocket. And now we're in the studio, you know, in the city, you know, in Midtown. And it's like, yo, we've had Spencer Dinwiddie, Robin Lumberg, like I mentioned. But then you start going through the names, and it's like, it's Howard Beck, it's Michelle Yu, it's, oh, wow, Anthony Puccio. That's right. We did have him on too early on, so shout out to Pooch. We had uh, Chris Shear very early on, and that was, you know, this is just our St. Francis days. And then we move on to the studio, and Michael Grady comes in. Michelle Yu comes back. Howard Beck comes back. Uh, Kevin Armstrong, who helped produce the Aaron Hernandez documentary, um, the one on Netflix and another one before that who used to write at the Daily News and does some writing at the New York Times. I was able to bring in Jillian DeCourcy, who's an MMA fighter. Like, we have uh, Josina Anderson called in. Um, Marley Rivera called in. So, yeah, it's just it's just a lot of – and Sky Zoo. Sky Zoo is another big one. And we were able to go to ESPN and get Bomani Jones and Pablo Torre and put that on the podcast too. So, like, we've done – We've done a lot of good things, and we're about to drop our 111th episode. We're probably going to have already dropped that by the time this actual podcast drops that I'm on with you guys. So, But, yeah, I'm proud of the work that we've done there, and I'm proud of just like what we've been able to, to do in terms of growth because it's moving basically every week. And, you know, I just know that at the end of the day, the content is getting better and we're making a little bit more of an impact and it's opening opening up opportunities for us and for other people that have been there uh, to sort of do that. So, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. I mean, as I mentioned to you off the record, maybe I made stuff not in a year, but like looking at what you guys do, how much fun and just providing great content it, it feels. It's not about the clout, as we always joke about. Yeah. It's like honestly what it means for not just you guys but the people who follow and will follow so it really speaks to what you guys have done thus far yeah. and it's not easy like this should, like i mean you guys you're learning it now sort of trial by fire but this podcasting shit is not easy like a lot of people think that just because they can't do a podcast that they can't do a podcast and a lot of people really there's a reason why a lot of people start and they eventually stop or there's a reason why people have these sort of issues with consistency and, you know, consistency is like the hardest thing to sort of come by in sort of podcasting and then just standing out and getting getting those numbers that people want to get, even though to me it's not about the numbers necessarily, but they do matter to some degree. They're not irrelevant, but like you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to do that. In a, in, a, in a fun, engaging, entertaining, insightful way and really stand out from literally the billions of other podcasts that are out there. So, you yeah, know, no, I think definitely. people, yeah, I think people get into it and then think that it's going to be, you know, something that it takes a lot of time to even get there. And Brian, what do you think are some successful keys, like the keys to success when it comes to podcasting? Um, uh, just being, 
people want people want to be let let in, especially since you know, like everyone's on their phones all day. Like they want access to people, and that's another thing too that really helps people out. Like a lot of people, in an effort to sort of get followers, they just sort of like, you know, telling certain parts of their life story on social media that they probably wouldn't otherwise. You know what I mean? Not for like, not that it's good or bad, but I th- I think what I'm saying is that a lot of people open up on social media because it'll feel like they're or engaging in some type of way that is really just, you know, opening up the curtain and allowing other people to come in. And what that does is a lot of people feel invested into, you know, said person or whoever the case may be. So people like that on their podcast. People like when people are open. Um, People like when people are insightful. People like when people are funny. And I think that's what works with, I mean, Joe Budd is an example of a podcast that I listen to all the time. When? And yeah, <laughs> twin. <laughs> and he's somebody that I listen to all the time because of a lot of those things. Not necessarily the openness, because I don't really need to be in all of his business, but you do want to feel like you know the person that you're listening to or watching. You want to feel like you're really in a room with them. So I think that helps. It's just, and I would say not in a detrimental way, but and not being shy to sort of give out maybe your your take on things your 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 sort of spin on things and just just really be honest to how you feel about certain situations like i think the podcast with dexter and i works and you know even more lately i've been getting a little more personal just about my situation uh as far as like as it relates to the industry and stuff that we're sort of touching on now like i've really opened up about that in the last few episodes a little bit more because i think people should know what it really is like I you know that. That beyond what they yeah. see not from a self absorbed because i don't I, I could give a fuck less if people are gonna you know it's not like i have a gofundme out here you know what i mean <laughs> and it's not and first of all it's not like i'm broke either you know what i'm saying like i'm uh, doing okay but what i'm saying is like i there there are certain things that you want to you want to give game to your listeners at the end of the day you want to give game to your listeners in what you really know and the stuff that you've really studied and the stuff that you've experienced like they want that so they want to feel like they're a part of your personal interaction because the reason why people love talk radio uh back in the day when that was really the thing and still do now to some degree is because you're not just watching them you're listening to them so they're in your ears all the time and you really feel like you're getting to know the person because this person is essentially talking to you all the time so you want to get like just valuable information for whoever that is or whoever they are. Exactly. exactly. You hit it right there on the nail. Uh, that, that, that's how it is. Cause like you said, it's just kind of, uh, kind of opening up to yourself. Cause people, especially with podcasts, they want to, they want to listen to the actual person. They don't want to see what, like obviously what you put on social media is like different, but hearing like it firsthand talk about their personal experiences. Like you mentioned before, a perfect example is Joe Rogan. For example, a lot of people yes. just know Another Joe Rogan. Is- yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, his podcast is amazing because well, yeah. if you look at Joe, well, I, if you look at I don't Joe, listen to all of them because they're too, they, he he drops too damn many. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, he <laughs> dropped he drops that he drops clips. He's got like three YouTube yeah. channels just about podcasts. But it's, that's how he is because everyone knew Joe Rogan as the guy that interviewed the fighters and called the UFC fights. That's how it was. And but a comedian. then you look at and a comedian, and then you looked at the Joe Rogan podcast. You're like, oh wow, this guy's actually like a down to earth, basic dude. That has a pretty that has probably one of the most wildest stories that there are on the planet. Yeah, that's so he just that, that's how he is. But all right, Brian, you ready to talk some nets? All right, let's do it. <laughs> all right, let's talk about the current state in nets. What are they right now? I think they're twenty six and twenty nine. Bob East right now, still in the playoff hunt. What what's what's the season like in your opinion? Is it is it obviously everyone expected it to kind of be okay, wait till twenty twenty, like next season. That's when it's gonna really kick in the high gear, championship contenders, all that. But kind of what's your thoughts on this season? I mean, it's it's fine. You know what I mean? I think that it, you if you're a net fan, you probably would have expected to see more of the Karis Levert that we've seen the last several games than you've seen during the whole season because you would like to see Karis Levert cement himself as being that third guy for when Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant are both healthy next season. Yeah. The thing is, I don't know if – He's if, capable of that. Yeah, he should be. I mean, look, it, Kevin Durant is 
I don't know if he's going to be the same Kevin Durant, but he should still come back and be a top 10, 15 player off a of torn Achilles. Before the torn Achilles, he was arguably number one. But, you know, I'm just saying, like, this is a serious injury. I'm not going to just say, like, oh, he's definitely going to be back, you know, to where he was before. Like, let's let's also understand that he might be load managed to some degree next year. You know what I mean? Like, it's entirely yeah. possible, and that wouldn't be – that wouldn't be unlike the Nets to do that necessarily. You know, oh, they're, no. they're yeah. going to proceed with caution as they should because Kevin Durant is going to be the most valuable guy in that organization. And he's almost seven feet tall coming back from a torn Achilles. Like, that's something that you have to monitor very closely. But he looks like he's making significant progress. So I feel good about him being um, pretty much all star level next year. But we'll see. Ultimately, we'll see. But, but basically, what I'm saying is like, yeah, with Karis Levert, you don't really know. And beyond that, the injury stuff, he's been hurt basically every season outside of his second season where he played like 71 games. I mean, you know, little stuff here and there because obviously he missed 11 games. But for the most part, like he's gotten hurt or some form of serious injury every season. His rookie year, he didn't even play until like December or January. I forget what that was because he was still coming back from the serious foot injury at Michigan. So could he, you know, could you depend on him for that? Or are you going to try to move him because that contract is going to be movable because the extension is going to kick in for next season. I don't know what the value is going to be necessarily. And I don't really know how that's sort of playing out, you know, beyond this season. Um, and then Spencer Dinwiddie's situation is going to be very interesting because, you know, as good as he's as good as he's been at times this season, he has a player option for the year after next year, making next year essentially a contract season. What are you going to do with him? Joe Harris is a free agent at the end of this year. But then, and this is the part that I think people were missing when I was saying, look, it's not going to be just, oh, he wants to stay, so you got to keep him, you know, and it's going to be that easy because the domino effect happens. You sign him, guess what? The next year, Dinwiddie's going to be a free agent and yeah. Jared Allen's going to be a free agent. And Jared Allen is really going to get a long term contract when DeAndre Jordan already has a long term contract? I don't know. You with know what no, I mean? Exactly. With no trade exemption, all four. He's locked in all four. So yeah. He's not, he's not going anywhere. And then, he's there for four years because Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving are there for four years. What is that going to mean for Jared Allen? I don't know. But I'm raising these questions on social media, and I think people it's, it's lost in translation because, quite frankly, I don't have the best tone on Twitter. I don't. I think. I think I'm. I think I'm more likable in person because people seem to really vibe with me in person. And on social media, probably not as much. I think that's in my delivery. I don't know how to control that because you're reading words. You use know what I'm saying? Emojis. Exactly. <laughs> use more emojis. Exactly. But then it's like, yo, are we that stupid? Like, do we have to really just use emojis? Like, people use emojis at the beginning of all their tweets now, and I do it sometimes because it's more engaging. But I'm like, man, are we really that dumb? Do we need to look at pretty colors and smiley faces to attract <laughs> ourselves to reading the message? Anyway, I sound like a young curmudgeon now. But basically, like... With DeAndre Jordan, yeah, he's locked into the next four years. So what does that mean with Jared Allen's possible extension? What does it mean with Spencer Dinwiddie's possible extension? How is this team going to stay together? Who's going to be here next year? These are the questions that I'm thinking about as, as it relates to the Nets because I'm looking at the rest of the East, and I'm like, yo, um, you just signed Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving. Cool, but Giannis is still there. Philly can yeah. still figure it out defensively. Indiana, I don't think they're going to be a serious contender this year as good as they've been. But next year when Oladipo is probably going to be Victor Oladipo again, how are they going to look? Miami, who I really like what they're doing. Oh, I love Miami. Yeah, they're, they've been my favorite team to watch this year, except lately not as much uh, because I like the moves they're making and how they operate and how they really you know, stand just as a culture and the things that they establish. And I think that's legit. And they have that championship winning pedigree, which matters. And Toronto, they haven't gone really anywhere since losing Kawhi Leonard. How serious are they going to be? So I don't know like what sort of lies ahead for the Nets as it relates to all of that. I do know that it will be a disappointment if at minimum in the next three seasons you don't get one ring or at least make it to the championship. But I think Net fans at this point, they want a ring. They don't just want to make it there. They're going to be disappointed that they didn't win one. Like Kevin Durant. And Kyrie Irving came here to win a ring. But yeah. it's going to be a lot harder than I think people uh, who are fans of the team expect 
because it's not like when KD and Kyrie come back, you're shooting all the way up to the top of the East because that Eastern Conference is good. No, and that's not even mentioning. Right. And that's not even mentioning that, you know, LeBron and AD and Kawhi and all those dudes are still out West. Jokic, et cetera, et cetera. Like the NBA is really good. <laughs> the NBA is really, really good. <laughs> no, yeah, I got, I got, what do I got? I got one comment and I got one, one question slash comment. My yes. first comment, number one is Joe Harris. A lot of people are saying, oh, Joe Harris wants to come back. I get that. But the man's going to want to be paid. He's sure. not going to sign. He's not going to, he's not going to take another two years, 16 million or whatever it was. They signed last time. He's going to want to get paid. And he knows, obviously, everyone's like, oh, he could fit well on a contender. Well, he, he, he wants to get paid. And it's time for him to get paid because he's shown consistency throughout the years. Yeah. So that's one. And then the second thing is I've been, I've been kind of marinating on this idea for a little bit. But how would you like to see Serge Ibaka in a Nets uniform? Ooh, that's yes, interesting. Been that's, since, I would been love I think that's a together. good fit. That's interesting. Yeah. Um. Now, are you doing that with – him at center or are you doing that with him at the four i'm thinking him at the four and small because ball then five. you could you could have a small ball yeah well the small ball five allen's everyone said allen's working on his three-point shot we haven't seen much of it at all yeah but, i mean no but he he does like you know he's put him up i, I he's remember put him up, yeah yeah like so i i don't know I, I don't know if that's gonna come because i mean and no disrespect to this guy because i like him a lot but i saw ronde hollis jefferson work on that three-point shot all the time and it still hasn't come you know exactly, and he still found a way to become a valuable player, but he had to leave Brooklyn to do it. I don't really like the Jared Allen thing is so fascinating to me because DeAndre Jordan is the one that has a long term contract. I've even joked on my podcast that Jared Allen is stunting DeAndre Jordan's growth because he has that long term deal and Jared Allen doesn't. So it's like, yeah. what do you do there? And then, oh by the way, Nick Claxton is also right there, and we've seen Nick Claxton play. The dude is very talented. He's obviously raw as hell because he's a rookie. You know, he's young. He's only played 14 or so games this year 15 or whatever the case may be but he's 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 gonna be a pretty good player i feel confident in saying he's gonna be a pretty good player and he's the guy that they got in the second round smartly last year and i think that's that's that could grow into being a solid pick but you know we'll see i mean it's it's, i think serge Ibaka would be interesting i also don't know what that would cost and i also don't know who would stay here with them because other than kyrie irving Excuse me. Other than Kyrie Irving, DeAndre Jordan, and um, Kevin Durant, I have no idea what's going to happen with the rest of this roster. And it fascinates me because I can really see, like, is it possible they add a third star? And it's like, ooh, maybe they do shoot shoot up to the top of the East. But then what did they give up in that deal? Are they going to try to steal Bradley Beal away from the Wizards? I don't think he wants to leave the Wizards. He says he, he keeps saying he doesn't want to leave the Wizards. But, you know, is, is, is that going to be the guy? Is it going to be Drew Holiday? You know what I mean? So I, I have exactly. no idea. No idea. Yeah, because I, I was I was talking with Brian Lewis at Media Day about this. If you look at Nick Claxton's father, he's a big dude. He has the the physical size. So if Nick could grow into that kind of size and kind of get a little more like body on him, he'll be good. And he obviously the aggression's there. He's he's very confident for a, even a rookie, at least from what we've seen on the court and stuff. But like you said, like this this roster is up in the air. You don't know what type of moves they're going to make during the offseason. You don't know if they're going to so, go and get a third so. star. So up in the air, and I'm, I'm oh. also, I'm also, I'm also impressed, like somewhat impressed that they're they're even 26 and 29 or whatever their record is, because like I mean, you know, ma- mainly with Kevin Durant out, but also with Kyrie Irving out. But then again, with Kyrie Irving, like, and this is not really to discredit him, but there's not a large amount of evidence that sort of dictates that he's responsible directly for a lot of wins. You know what I'm saying on any team that he's been on, because in Cleveland, they started winning when LeBron got there. And in Boston, they were kind of winning before he got there. And they've been winning even more now that he's left. So I think Kevin Durant is the one that really swings. That is what I'm saying more than just Kyrie Irving does. And then both of them together, theoretically, would do that. But then you also have to see if they're going to stay healthy, too, for, for these next three years. And that's a big question with one guy coming off a torn Achilles being at nearly seven feet tall and the other guy just having a history of injuries. Um, two of his last three seasons ending in the serious season ending injury. So and how's that going to be? Because he's had injury issues really since college or high school. So. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, one more thing on that is kind of I don't think they should play back to backs. One and two, mm. I think with Kevin Durant, assuming he's at least seventy plus percent, it puts a lot less pressure on Kyrie. And I don't think the leadership thing, as like you know, a mindset, has been the problem for Kyrie. I just think the physical pressure it's put on him. Yeah, I think that he's always do more than he needs to do. 
I mean, yeah, it was amazing. Cortisone shot, and I saw in person one of the best individual games ever since LeBron scored 49 in the Nets in the playoffs, which was disheartening, but it was insanely impressive. So, like, those are some things to look about. Like, having someone like Katie will bring out the best because then you have a guaranteed floor spacer <laughs> closer to the front court, which certainly helps the way Kyrie likes to play. It'll make it easier for him to drive and X, Y, and Z. But anyways... Mm-hmm. So uh, what do you think the Nets have to do in order to take the mantle as the New York's basketball team? Obviously, it's not an easy task because the Knicks have been around far longer than the Nets were even a team, both ABA and M- slash NBA. So. There are people that say that, um, and I think Dexter is one of these guys too, that if the Nets win X amount of championships, it'll, it, like, even still, it'll never happen. But I don't know. So if I could really think about this real quick. If they win one championship, just one. Because, I mean, look, it's really hard to get one. And I know uh, Net fans will probably want two or three with these guys here. It's really, 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 really hard to do this, right? But let's just say they get one, which then it will be worth it, obviously. I don't know how far that swings the pendulum, but it makes things very interesting, especially if by that time the Knicks still haven't really gotten it together. And I think that's the main thing, right? Are the Knicks going to get good anytime soon? I have no idea. There's a path to it. You know what I mean? It requires player development and things of that nature. But if 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 they're still at the bottom of the sort of Eastern Conference and the Nets win a championship, I don't think that's enough to swing it because people are still going to be laughing at the Knicks more than they'll be complimenting the Nets. But it does make things interesting. Then what happens if they go back to back and they get two? You know what I mean? Then it's like, OK, what happens? But I think it's more of a generational thing. The Nets just haven't been in Brooklyn long enough. We have to think about, you know, 10, 20 years from now, when kids growing up in new sort of gentrified Brooklyn, how are they going to feel about the team that they're growing up with in this area? Or are they still going to come from Knicks fans? But I don't know. People from my generation and our generation, a lot of people growing up, they're not really fans of teams in that same way that previous generations were. A lot of guys that I grew up with were, rest in peace, Kobe fans or LeBron fans, or Tracy McGrady fans, or, you know, uh, Paul Pierce fans. They weren't that many Paul Pierce fans. Mm-hmm. But you know what I'm saying? Like, there, there, were, there were a bunch of guys that were fans of uh, individual players. So I don't really know. I think we're going to have to – we're going to have to – we're going to have to see if the Nets, one, win a title, maybe two, or two, and two, if the Knicks get their shit together, and three – What's going to happen over the next 10, 15, 20 years? You know, are, are, are more kids going to grow up with this team and then sort of buy into that in a way that people from New Jersey grew up with the Nets and then became Nets fans? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, my thing is I – two would be great. One is honestly all I want, but that still won't be enough. You need one championship minimum, and then you need consistency of being a 40-plus win team and then along the way hopefully getting at least one or two more. I think, let's say, three over the next, let's say, I, mean, I know this is like a terrible time frame for things, but let's say three over the next two decades, but maintain being the more winning of teams, I think is part of it. But as you said, you know, you got to, I hate this term, indoctrinate the younger oh. generation. Yeah. Yeah, no, you do. You do. And and it also depends on, it also depends on what the Knicks do. If they really turn it around and get good again, then we know how. Excuse me. We know how that's going to go, but the Knicks, you know, the, the, like the, this is this is a chance for the Nets to take advantage. They stole Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving away from them, but now they have to win with them while the Knicks are still incompetent. So it's kind of a lot to ask for necessarily. But I think for the Nets, like oh, like if they just win a championship, they could care less. Like if they just win one, you know what I mean. I'm sure they want more than one, but I'm saying if they just win one, then they could care less. And it's like it, you know, they'll make they'll make Brooklyn at least a, a, a Nets borough necessarily if that makes oh, sense for sure yeah yeah exactly and then give you guys a little perspective of like just me i grew up in new jersey literally 30 minutes away from the meadowlands so right when when they literally moved to brooklyn and i know a lot of friends at that time 2012 i was entering entering high school kind of seventh eighth grade at that time to give you guys a little perspective but um when they moved a lot of a lot of there was a mix a lot of guys were like oh you know what forget about this team i'm becoming a nick fan and I, I know a lot of my friends i grew up Mets fans now they're nick fans for that but to to kind of do the mantle right i see it this way number one is the nets still have a even if like you guys said even if they win x amount championships people know if you've been to the city and if you've ever been in any basic uber or whatever the case is you can't take nick pride out of a random guy 
especially if they grew up in New York City. Sure. So I don't. You could see it as this, right? I say if the net, the Nets say they win one, two championships, whatever the case is, I think nationwide people are going to say, you know what, the Nets may be the better team in New York in New York City, but inside New York City at that time, I don't think the Nets I are going to have that respect. It. That's yeah. how I see it. I think, yeah, and I just think a big factor again is just whether or not the Knicks are going to get it together because kids now, like our kids now, growing up with. Nick with the same Knicks that they were in the 90s? Absolutely not. You know what I mean? Like Dexter, going back to him for an example, he was born in the in the mid 80s. So when he's growing up in the 1990s, the Knicks are good every year. They have a 10 year run where they're one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference most of that time and championship contenders. They went to two finals and things like that. Like that's a that's a great historic run. But the kids now are not growing up with that. You know what I mean? The kids in Harlem, they're not necessarily growing up with the New York Knicks being great in that way. What you have is the 54 win season and Lynn Sanity. And that's, Car- you know, yeah, Carmelo. And that's it. Carmelo, Porzingis for a little bit. You got RJ Barrett and Mitchell Robinson now, but those guys have to really develop before, you know, you could start seeing a lot of their jerseys in the street necessarily. So like they, they need to get it together first. And then we'll really see. That's why that's why I think this next, you know, these next several years are going to be interesting. Who builds what? Who accomplishes what? Like that the results matter at the end of the day. And then we'll really see in the future how that uh, sort of um, transpires. I agree with that. I agree with that. All right. Now let's get to your favorite topic that we discussed earlier. Kemba versus Kyrie. Oh, God. <laughs> all, all the, the floor is yours. I look, I don't again, my my whole thing with Kemba Walker was that I think that when we when we rank players, we think that somebody is so much better than somebody else because a lot of it is situational. Kyrie Irving was next to LeBron James. So I felt like that sort of amplified how people looked at him. He great. He's one of the best ball handlers ever. He's one of the best finishers ever at the guard spot. He shoots a very high percentage. But we're seeing it now happen in Boston and seeing it play out that, look, Kemba Walker and the Celtics are championship contenders. They almost beat the Lakers today without Kemba Walker even being there. And if Kemba Walker was there, he probably would have helped in the fourth quarter where Jason Tatum went quiet. Right. So I think that he's not even averaging the assists that I thought he would. But a lot of that and I'm watching these games and he's getting out the way and letting guys do their thing. Kyrie Irving just wasn't doing that as much because he was so ball dominant. You know, that's just a style of play thing. It's not really a knock on anybody's sort of character or whatever the case may be. But Kemba Walker, he he gets out of the way and he's letting people sort of do their thing. Tatum and Brown are sharing the ball and they're passing it to Marcus Smart. And then Daniel Tice is getting it in the inside. Like I've seen entire plays where Kemba Walker just gives the ball up and runs to the corner or he just stands in the corner the whole time and doesn't even bring the ball up. So I think that matters. And I think Brad Stevens is running more of the offense that he's wanted to run that he probably couldn't with Kyrie there because Kyrie Irving, you know, wants to come off screens and do other things with the ball. And I think that the Kemba Walker thing, he's just a better fit there for what they're doing than Kyrie is, period. I agree with that. That, that, that. I I don't even need to comment on that. That's 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 it. That's how yeah. that's how I feel on it. Yeah, the yeah. only thing I got to add is just uh, longevity when it comes to injury. I mean, Kemba hasn't really been injured as frequently, and when it has, it hasn't you know, well, had such long-term. Been... I think that's oh, another big one, so when it comes to restarting. The other thing um, I would that's say that's is a big thing, yeah. the bigger thing that – why I was confident that Kemba would do well in Boston, whether you know it would be as good as they are now or even a little bit worse, is that the teams that he carried, even though what he, they weren't in the playoffs that much during his time yeah. transitioning from Bobcat and stuff, like those are hard teams to carry. Right, and th- 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 that's the thing. It's like, yo, he had Jeremy Lamb as the second best player, and they almost made the playoffs last year. But like Kyrie Irving hasn't really impacted wins in that way throughout his career like that. You know what I mean? He has when LeBron is by his side. But in other situations, like if you look at the Boston team when Isaiah Thomas was there versus the Boston team when Kyrie Irving was there, you know, the teams weren't that weren't that different. They really weren't. And Isaiah Thomas put up crazy numbers that year. You know what I mean? Like, so it's just... 
it's just kind of, and the whole thing with Kemba Walker also is like when people will tell you just being around him, they always compliment his leadership and what a great guy he is. And, you know, Kyrie Irving, let's say he's left people with mixed reviews for whatever that's worth. And I'm not just making that up. That's out there like there. You know, he's he's a polarizing figure, whether people want to admit it or not. Kemba Walker, not really like I a lot, there are a lot of people walking this earth who probably have never heard him speak before. Like, I'm not even making that up. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, it's just. It's just more of a fit than, and I think, I think in general, like the way we look at players, is just so dependent on fit a lot of times. Like in a vacuum, I think that if you put certain guys against each other and pit them one on one, you'd probably be surprised at the results. You know what I mean? Like I'm not trying to insinuate one thing or another when I say this, but take Steph Curry off those Golden State Warrior teams that won those championships and put Damian Lillard there. Do you really think they're going to drop off significantly? No. You know what I mean? Not like, too much, yeah. if Damian Lillard, I don't know if he's as good as him, but when you watch him, it's like it's it's almost the same guy. All these dudes put in a ton of work. Like all these dudes are really, 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 really good. Like they're really, really, really good. And it, it's like when if if you're doing it in two two K, right? If you're giving Kyrie a ninety overall, I would say that Kemba Walker is an eighty nine at least. You know what I mean? You're talking yeah, about a one that. point difference. They always have like Kyrie at like 90 and Kemba like 87. And I'm like, they're closer than that. Same with Damian Lillard and Kyrie, uh, Damian Lillard and, and Steph Curry. I think they're probably closer than what they say, although Damian Lillard is higher now because Steph Curry is actually injured. But I think, yeah, certain players, certain players swing the pendulum heavy, like LeBron James, the teams that he's been on, the teams that he's left, other than Miami, because Miami's actually had a 48 win season after he left, you know, like two years after whatever the case may be, because they still were able to keep some guys because their infrastructure is great. Unlike Cleveland's, but yeah, certain guys swing the pendulum in that way. And look, Kemba Walker for what it's worth. He's done that ever since he's developed into an all-star player. He's really like had terrible contracts on his team and he somehow brought them to the playoffs and, or, or, de- or really close. No, that's exactly how it is. A lot of things, the one thing that Kemba doesn't get a lot of credit for is he has – it's not like he, this is new to Kemba. If you look – just look at look up UConn Kemba. That's all you got to look at. Yeah. This guy. This guy's always been the, kind of that main guy. UConn, if you just – if you, you – he wasn't even projected to make it to the national championship game. Not even close. And you right. just look what he did at UConn. And then you look at the Bobcats. He had the, like you said with the contract signs, especially with Batum. That's the headliner of the whole thing. And then you see everyone else, what he's done to all these teams. Well, Charlotte and obviously Boston. But you see the impact that he's made on these teams is, like you said, he's not that kind of poster boy point guard figure that everyone sees in the NBA like a Steph Curry or Kyrie. But the work ethic and kind of what he's done to the franchise behind that cannot be ignored. Yeah. It, it, yeah. And that's that's mainly what it is. And it's like, look, look at Boston now. Kyrie Irving is out um, and Kemba Walker's in. And now Tatum and Brown are doing what people thought that they would have done last year because last year was all messed up for, you know, whether it was Kyrie, whether it was this or was that. It was a bunch of reasons that Boston, it just didn't work out for them last year. And then, you know, things happen this year. They have Kemba Walker now, and it's like Tatum actually develops to what we thought he was going to be last year. Jalen Brown, the same thing. Tatum was an all-star. I thought Brown should have been an all-star over him. And then as soon as that happened, uh, Tatum has been an all-star ever since. Like he's really taken it to another level and really earned that all-star bid. But at the time, his numbers weren't better than Jalen Brown's. Now that shifted. And then, uh, you know, you have other guys just playing like Marcus Smart. He's playing well. You have just other guys just playing well. And again, Brad Stevens getting to do more of what he wants. And Brad Stevens is one of the reasons that Kemba Walker went there. You know, Kyrie Irving, he didn't really choose Boston. He got traded there. You know, mm-hmm. like he didn't choose him in the way that he that chose. That was also the another Nets. thing that people forget about. Like part of the mindset is sometimes you, I mean, yeah, you're, it's business. You got to play, but sometimes, you know, in the back of your mind, I mean, yeah, he had the family issue as well. I mean, or it could have just been, you know, the veteran presence. There were several vets that probably had their own way of doing things, several youth and, you know, sometimes a clash. I mean, look at Cleveland. They quickly went through a coach and probably <laughs> most would expect. So, 
Yeah, uh, yeah, the John B. I mean, well, that thing was weird from the start. Um, John B. Yeah, I was very was confused NBA. when they made that signing. Yeah, that was so weird. I joked that I joked that. Oh, oh, this is. <laughs> I joked in the summer. I'm like, oh, oh, net fans better be careful because Karen Levert <laughs> might fuck around, <laughs> go a free agency with his college coach, and he's from Ohio too. But that ain't gonna happen. John B. Lines out of there. Um, that wasn't gonna happen anyway. Come on, it's Cleveland getting a free agent. Um, but yeah, yeah so I mean, that's 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 mainly what it is. It's like you know, and the Kyrie Irving thing. I think if if it's if it's gonna work with Kyrie Irving again in a way that it did with LeBron, the best player in the world, then it has to be with a guy like Kevin Durant. And they obviously chose to come here together. So we're gonna see what ultimately happens with that. Um, you guys know the what the noise has been, and. Whether or not, you know, a lot of it is true and things like that. I don't know because I'm not really around them this year in the way that I was the last three years. So I don't know what to say about all that stuff. Uh, but all I will say is that from a basketball perspective, you would think that KD, Kyrie and a bunch of dudes is enough. But uh, this isn't just a basketball thing. They have to work things out on the court and see what happens. But I do think that Boston is going to be a title contender this year. I think they're a legitimate title contender. I'd feel better about them if they're if they were able to get uh, like a Tristan Thompson type of big on a buyout market. But it doesn't look like Tristan Thompson is going to get bought out again. I don't know what the fuck Cleveland's doing, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with Boston. You know what I mean? But I think I think they're in a good spot. Exactly. Well, we'll leave it there, Brian. We appreciate you hopping on, dropping some knowledge, and enjoy the rest of your night, my man. Yeah, for sure. Thank you guys for having me. Of course. So, okay, Chris, time to give the closing remarks. Yeah, so remember, feel free to email over any suggestions, questions, comments, or thoughts on any of our content by sending an email to wingspanpodcast at gmail.com. Do not forget to follow us on our social media accounts and make sure you subscribe to our podcast on your preferred listening service. And as for next time, stay classy and take care. Yay!